Question one, John participated in a successful group intervention that targeted teamwork when working towards a common goal. The program consisted of most to least prompting, functional communication training, and differential reinforcement. The designer of the intervention wants to now determine what procedure was most effective in the intervention. How could the designer find this out? All right, so if you've been studying a while, hopefully a couple of thoughts are coming to mind. Um, when we're doing our questions, we want to attack the question, okay? So we want to try and predict our answers before reading the answer choices. That's how we're gonna get good, right? We wanna be aggressive towards the test. We don't want the test coming at us and we don't wanna be intimidated by the test, we want to attack these questions. So when you read the following sentence, the designer of the intervention wants to now determine which procedure was most effective in the intervention, what do you think of? Well, you should start thinking of parametric analysis and component analysis, okay? C and D, functional analysis and visual analysis have nothing to do with determining which procedure was most effective. Now, we might use visual analysis to help us figure out our component analysis results or our parametric analysis results, but visual analysis is not going to directly help us determine the procedure that was most effective. Now, how do we distinguish between parametric and component? Well, it's a matter of what type of medicine you're using versus how much of a dosage, right? So if you have Tylenol and Advil, okay, those are your components. If you're saying I'm giving you 10 milligrams of Advil versus 20 milligrams of Advil, that's your parametric analysis, okay? So if you want to determine in this case, which procedure is most effective between prompting, functional communication training, and differential reinforcement, of course, we're going to look at what? A component analysis. Those are our components. Now, if we determine that differential reinforcement is our most effective component, maybe then we conduct a parametric analysis to determine either the dosage of differential reinforcement, right? Or something of that matter, okay? But if you're just trying to determine the procedure, you're gonna use a component analysis. You quit smoking five months ago. So far, you've been happy with the lack of temptation you feel towards smoking a cigarette. Tonight, you attend a concert with your friends and go to a bar afterwards for a drink. When you sit down at the bar, you suddenly want a cigarette. What is most likely occurring? All right, so pretty common in this type of behavior. You haven't craved a cigarette at all for five months. Suddenly you get to this bar and you want a cigarette. Okay, why is that happening? What is going on here? Are you having a, a moment of low self-control? A, well, no, we know self-control is what? It's a misnomer. Self-control, quote unquote, is just the environment acting on us, okay? So we don't have no self-control or we, we don't have a high level of self-control. It's all about the environment still, okay? So A is out. B, the stimuli in the bar is acting as a punisher towards smoking. Well, you're not smoking, right? So nothing is being delivered to be able to punish the behavior. In addition, you're now craving the cigarette, okay? So you want to smoke. So we know nothing is punishing you in this bar, okay? C, smoking is under stimulus control of the bar. Yes, right? Stimulus control, a behavior occurs in the presence of certain stimuli and not in the presence of others. You've been hanging out with your friends all night. You're at a concert for five months. You've been fine. Nothing. As soon as you get to this bar, what happens? All these stimuli around you, all these things that are quote unquote associated, right? In the past with smoking, okay? They all act as, as these essentially for your smoking behavior. In the past, smoking has been reinforced in the presence of this bar and the stimuli in the bar. So smoking is under stimulus control of the bar. Why is smoking not under stimulus control of your friends? Well, it says you were at a concert earlier with those friends, but only when you sat down at the bar did you want that cigarette, okay? So you need to read these questions carefully, right? Use the information given and pick the best answer, okay? So C and D are both decent answers, but C is just much better. If test scores are the dependent variable, which of the following could function as the independent variable? Now, what is the dependent variable and what is the independent variable? That's what you need to ask yourself, okay? Well, the dependent variable, right, is the one that we're gonna be manipulating with our independent variables, okay? So essentially the independent variable causes the dependent variable to do something, 
okay? And when we manipulate the independent variable, we're hoping, okay, we're affecting the dependent variable so we can get that functional control and demonstrate functional control. Okay, that's the whole idea behind these um, single subject experiments, right? We want to demonstrate control over our dependent variable. So in this case, if test scores are a dependent variable, what can we manipulate to alter the test scores? That's what we're saying here, okay? When we talk about independent variables, that's what we're adding, removing, and manipulating to influence the dependent variable. So A, amount of sleep. If we gave one person a test who got two hours of sleep versus a person who got a good, night, good night's rest, could that affect test scores? Absolutely, okay? What about the amount of studying? Well, obviously the amount of studying is going to have a, an effect on test scores or potentially have an effect on test scores. And then time of day. If you take a test really early in the morning or maybe around lunchtime when you're hungry, or maybe at one o'clock when you are full and you're, that's the best time of day for test taking for you, will that have an effect on test scores? It certainly could. So what do the following of these could function as an independent variable, something we could manipulate to try to change the dependent variable? Well, any of these, right? So we can go with D, all of the above. Which of the following measurement procedures would be most effective at capturing every topography in a response class? Okay, be careful here, right? We're looking at topography. So what is a topography? Well, that's how the behavior looks, right? That's we're describing what the behavior looks like. And if we want to capture every single topography in an entire response class, that might be a lot of topographies, okay? And if we're going to capture everyone, what do we need to do? Well, we need to observe that behavior at all times. We need to observe or the behaviors continuously, right? Because we want to capture every possible topography of those responses in the response class. So how are we going to do that? Are we going to use whole interval recording? Would that be most effective? Well, maybe not. Whole interval recording, this discontinuous measurement procedure, we might miss several topographies because we might be only recording data for 20 minutes out of a three hour session. So we might miss a lot in those other in that other time where we're not taking whole interval data. So discontinuous measurement would not be most effective at capturing every topography in a response class. What about permanent product recording? Permanent product, do we actually are we actually observing this behavior? occurring. Now, typically, that's one of the uh, benefits of permanent product, right, is we can measure what occurs after the behavior happens, the product, and then take data on that. But we're not actually watching how that behavior looks. So permanent product's not going to necessarily be most effective at capturing every topography. Frequency recording. Sure, frequency recording is continuous. We're taking data throughout session on every instance of behavior. So every time that behavior or the responses in this response class occur, we're taking data on it and we're observing it. So we could certainly, okay, capture most, if not all, topographies in a certain response class. Frequency recording is continuous. And then indirect recording, of course, would not help us. Why? Well, indirect recording, we're not actually observing the behavior happen, okay? We're talking to people about it. We're giving surveys, we're conducting interviews, but we're not directly recording anything. So continuous measurement where we're directly observing is going to be the most effective. So our answer here is going to be C, frequency recording. Dan is learning to play blackjack. He likes to yell blackjack whenever his cards equal 21. Dan is now yelling blackjack whenever he's dealt an ace. This is called what? All right. Clearly some sort of generalization is going on here okay he he learned blackjack equals 21 and now he's just yelling blackjack whenever he feels like it whenever he gets an ace okay just yelling this word okay what's happening here well what can we eliminate can we eliminate discrimination certainly right you know there's a difference between 21 and being dealt an ace okay is differentiation occurring is response differentiation occurring well, no, response differ differentiation is two different responses, right? You know, switching between responses when appropriate. This is the same response over and over again. So discrimination and differentiation are certainly not occurring. What about stimulus and response generalization? Which one is happening here? Well, how can you remember the difference between the two? 
Well, you ask yourselves, how many responses are there and how many stimuli? Well, we have one response for multiple stimuli. So we're looking at stimulus generalization. Response generalization is just the opposite. You're going to have one stimulus with multiple responses. So if you have multiple stimuli, you're dealing with stimulus generalization. If you have multiple responses, you're dealing with response generalization. In this case, he's generalizing this response of blackjack from 21 to ace. So now this response is being generalized across multiple stimuli. Britt is concerned about the guest list for her wedding. Several members of her family do not get along. To avoid conflict, she arranges the seating using a seating chart. Britt is using what? So Britt wants to avoid any drama, any issues at her wedding. Is she taking preventative measures or is she taking reactive measures? Britt is being preventative. She wants to prevent these things from happening. When we prevent something from happening, what are we using? Are we using antecedent manipulations or are we using consequence manipulations? Or we're clearly using antecedent manipulations. Antecedent manipulations, antecedent arrangements are preventative. We're preventing something from occurring. Consequence manipulations are reactive. Something took place, a response took place. Now we're reacting through consequences. Okay. We just attacked that question. We just predicted the answer choice. Let's see if we can find it. A, punishment. Is Brit using punishment? No, because she's not using a consequence, right? Based on our analysis, she's using some sort of antecedent manipulation. So B as well can be eliminated. If we look at C, that's what we predicted. That's what we're going to choose, right? That's what exactly what we thought it was. Brit is preventing conflict and drama using antecedent manipulation by arranging her seating chart or her seating using a seating chart. And then baseline data, we're not sure if Brit has actual data on her members of her family. This could be anecdotal for all we know. So we just can't pick baseline data, okay, based on the information they give us. Based on the information given, our best answer here is gonna be C, antecedent manipulation. Growing up, your parents always told you to not eat raw cookie dough because you would get sick. Now, even as an adult, you try and avoid eating raw cookie dough. What type of behavior is this? Did you actually eat raw cookie dough and get sick? Doesn't seem like it, right? Based on the information given, you never actually ate the raw cookie dough and got sick. However, you are still avoiding eating raw cookie dough based on what your parents told you all those years ago. So when we engage in behavior, right, based on some sort of verbal, okay, contingency, what type of behavior is this? Is that rule governed? Yes, right? This is a rule. Your parents told you, okay, if you eat raw cookie dough, then you will get sick. This contingency never actually took place for you based on this information. However, you're still adhering to this rule, okay? Contingency shaped is this, is this thing actually happened to you. The consequence affected your future behavior. If this question said growing up, your parents told you not to eat raw cookie dough because you would get sick, one day you ate raw cookie dough and got sick. Now you try and avoid eating raw cookie dough. That would be contingency shaped. That contingency actually occurred. This is just a verbal contingency. If you do this, then you do this, or then this will happen. Therefore, you don't do that, right? It's rule, or you do do that. It's rule governed, okay? Understand the difference between rule governed and contingency shaped. It's not punishment controlled. All right, because the punishment never occurred. The consequence never actually occurred. It's all rule governed. And then it's not respondent behavior because it's going to be the three, our three-term operant contingency. Respondent behavior is our two-term respondent contingency. So we can eliminate C and D. Our best answer is going to be A, rule governed. Okay, speaking of formal similarity, which of the following examples lacks formal similarity? So when we talk about operants, we talk about formal similarity and point-to-point -point correspondence. Point-to-point -point correspondence means it's just identical, right? So if I say egg, you say egg, that's point-to-point -point correspondence, okay? They're equal. Formal similarity is dealing with what? It's dealing with what it looks like. When we're worried about verbal behavior, we're not worried about the form so much as the function. However, you need to know the formal similarity to identify the operants. 
formal similarity again is what does it look like? Okay, what is the form of the operant or the item? The question asks you what of the following examples lacks formal similarity? So you're looking for something that doesn't necessarily look alike. How about A, Sports Illustrated Magazine and Teen Magazine? Two printed magazines, right? Two essential, two pieces of print, right? Do these have formal similarity? Sure, different content, same form. Be a stop sign and a yield sign. Again, serve different functions, but are they formally similar? Yes, okay. See the spoken word egg and the written word egg. Are these formally similar? No. Two spoken words are formally similar, but a spoken word and a written word appear in different forms, right? They look different. So C, they do not have formal similarity. And then what about D? John says, how are you? And I say, I am fine. Both spoken, both formally similar. So which of the following examples lacks formal similarity? C, the spoken word egg, and the written word egg. An RBT is working on identical matching with a client. The RBT will deliver SD, deliver the prompt, and then wait three seconds for a response. The RBT is now delivering her SD, waiting three seconds for a response, and then delivering her prompt. This is an example of what? Okay, careful here, right? Kind of a convoluted, confusing question, but just ask yourself, what is the RBT doing with this prompt, right? It's a prompting question. She first did what? She delivered her SD, gave her prompt, waited for a response. Then she delivered her SD, waited three seconds, and then delivered her prompt. So what did she do? Is she engaging in graduated guidance? Well, we're not sure if she's delivering physical prompts or what kind of prompts, so we can't really claim it's graduated guidance without knowing that information, so E is out. Or A is out, I should say. What about B, prompt delay? Yes, she is delaying her prompt, right? Initially, it's just SD right to the prompt. Now it's SD, wait three seconds, deliver the prompt. Give that person more time to respond. This is an example of prompt delay. Is she fading the prompt? Well, not necessarily, right? The prompt is still being delivered in this case, okay? So she's not necessarily fading the prompt quite yet, all right? She's attempting to, clearly, right? Because she wants to see this person respond without the prompt, then she can fade it, but she still delivers the prompt, so the prompt isn't faded. And then D, least the most prompting. Again, we don't know what type of prompting she's delivering. This is simply an example of B, prompt delay. All right, thanks for watching.